took to uh, Portland and Nina Rea did those. And uh, she, she's a uh, restorer of documents and uh, did a wonderful job. In fact, they look just like new. So we're very pleased with them. And then you and I did volunteer labor yeah. for cleaning <laughs> frames and hanging and so forth. Yeah. So. <laughs>
performance number four, I believe. <laughs> Fourteen, but here we go.
traditions. And one of our traditions is awarding, um, recognizing two alumni each year. And this year, um, we would like to recognize Louise T. Flanders for her loyalty and support to Berwick over the years. She has been just an incredible alumni. She was born and raised in South Berwick. She lives in South Berwick today, but her health is failing, and unfortunately, she cannot be with us. Uh, she graduated from Berwick in 1936. She was a very active member of her class. Uh, she was called Turnip at the time, and she wanted to become a doctor. And she uh, went into the pre-med program at the University of New Hampshire. She transferred to Mary Hitchcock School, but then she had some health problems and she had to uh, come back home. But finally, with her persistence and her known tenacity, she graduated from the University of New Hampshire in 1950. She later became a uh, professor at the Medical College in Virginia, and she developed an um, information system for nurses and doctors and was widely recognized for that. She got her master's degree from the University of Syracuse, Syracuse but later she missed uh, Maine and she missed New England and she came back home. And she de devoted her life to serving people and to serving Burke Academy, which is one of her great loves. And we are sorry that she can't be with us tonight, but we appreciate all of her commitment to this school, and we are very proud and happy to make this award to her this evening. Priscilla Grokey is going to be receiving the award for her.
she would like to say. 50th anniversary of the class of 1946. Uh, we'd like to make a gift tonight to Hat Ridgeway, which we hope will be put towards the preservation of the stained glass windows that you've all enjoyed today in the Fog Memorial. We'd like to see them in, uh, preserved so that the future generations can benefit and enjoy them as much as we have in the past. Thank you.
treat. I hope we did not uh, run too quickly through that because the alumni are the heart of the school. We are gathered tonight to celebrate the uh, uh, end of the capital campaign of the third century campaign and we are gathered tonight they're taking down the screen already and we're gathered tonight to rededicate fog memorial it's a time to honor the past it's a time to celebrate the present it's a time to rededicate ourselves to the future and most of all most of all, it is a time to say thank you to all who have made tonight and the rededication of Fogg and the and success of the third century campaign possible. We are also gathered, and let there be no question about this, we're gathered to have a lot of fun. We have an Alumni Council sponsored Alumni Day. We have a Wendy Persig written, Nathan Amston produced, Richard Norcross Crock, Berwick Student Performed, Fog Light Show, which will follow right after this, and after that we have Ben Baldwin and the Blue Note, and they will be great. So hold on. I want to offer a, a lot of thanks, and I'm simply not going to do it. Uh, we, it would be an impossible task. Uh, I would probably, uh, I would certainly start uh, with Skip DeVito and Tony Olbrays who started designing Fog Memorial, uh, it was a twinkle in their eyes many years ago. And if I move through it all, I would end up with the Fog Rededication Committee, which has worked half this year to put together this event. Uh, and there are many wonderful stories in between. Uh, they, the, the good fortune of being the head of a school like this is that I know most of those stories. They're stories of generosity, they're stories of support, they're stories of enthusiasm. We have a wonderful school and we are rich with those stories. But it would be an impossible task. And so I leave that, I leave it in that memorial uh, program you all received that was designed by Deirdre Nadeau. And in her normal magic, she tried to create a giant thank you card to all who have made tonight possible. I, I hope you enjoy it. I hope you keep that. There is one thank you that I cannot avoid and I will not avoid. I'm going to ask uh, two uh, men who have uh, been very important to this academy for the last five years during the capital campaign to come forward and they're going to help me make a presentation. Uh, the two men are the two of the presidents of the board of trustees, Arnold Cates and Donald Hatt. Could you come up now?
success of this campaign. Great as that number is, it still does not include those who participated indirectly through the Parents Association, in the Bulldog Boosters, and in the Alumni Association. But better than that, think of what those numbers have meant in preparing the Academy for the third century. One and a half new athletic fields and an irrigation system for all of our fields. A new home, a wonderful new home for our middle schoolers in the Clement Building. A great new tennis facility with six new courts. On the horizon, and as you all noticed today, a new parking and drive system which is under construction. Also what you noticed, a fabulous new athletic center with a large field house, a fitness center, a dance room, and new locker rooms. An increase in our endowments of $2 million. And tonight, we rededicate Fog Memorial, the Academy's signature building for the last 100 years, and after this three-year restoration for the next 100 years. If you all would uh, join with me, hopefully there is some champagne or uh, uh, something to celebrate with. Hopefully it's been uncorked, and if you would all pour your glasses, I would like to propose a toast. It's non-alcoholic and good for everybody.
Luxembourg Academy, my old school, how good it is to see you gathered here tonight to rededicate the building I helped build 100 years ago. My name is Horatio Twombly. I was president of the Academy's trustees from 1886 to 1897, and William Fogg was my uncle. Did you ever wonder how this big, beautiful building came to be here on the quiet hilltop of Little South Berwick? Well, Uncle William Fogg was quite a guy, and it's quite a story. Let me tell you. As you know, Berwick Academy goes back 205 years, making it the oldest school in Maine. And for all that time, that's been a tradition of giving to the cause of education. Uncle William Fogg and I come from one of the families who founded Berwick Academy in 1791. The founders said this school was for the purpose of promoting true piety and virtue and useful knowledge. Must have been peaceful then up here on the hill. Look at the little white schoolhouse. To build it cost $733 and there were only 40 students, all high school age, of course. That little building is now one of the oldest white schoolhouses in America. I'm glad to see you've kept it all these years, though it's moved around a bit. When it was first built, it actually stood right about here. When I was a student in the 1840s, James Polk was president of the United States. Burke Academy had grown. A larger schoolhouse had been built. We all thought my school building was pretty nice too. Burke was co-educational even way back then. I was lucky my parents let me come to classes every day instead of doing chores on the farm. There were hardly any books. And it was hard doing homework by candlelight. Have you ever tried doing homework by candle? <clears throat> No, thank you. Instead, I'd study on my way to and from school, three miles on foot. That's how I memorized my Latin and Greek verbs. Amo, amas, amat, amamus. Those were hard times for borough families. Everyone was poor. Farming was hard. The mills down on the river brought jobs, but also lots of rowdy strangers. It was kind of a rough town then. One year, a mill worker was robbed and murdered in the woods behind Berwick Academy. The state of Maine banned alcohol for a while. There was a rum rebellion with bootleggers and arsonists. And here's why tonight, I can't show you the building where I went to school. One night, it was August 27, 1851.
day for Burke Academy, but the school rebuilt and went on. After graduation, I went to Dartmouth, got my law degree, and went to work in Wisconsin. But meanwhile, Uncle William Fogg had launched an extraordinary enterprise, a Far East shipping company. See, Uncle William Fogg had also grown up on a local farm, but never got to go to Burke Academy. Yet he was smart enough to get a ship, and with it, he broke into the China trade. This was in 1847, at the close of the Opium War, when the Treaty of Nanking first made Hong Kong a British colony. After Matthew Perry's voyage opened up Japan, Uncle William Fogg's business spread there too, carrying silks, teas, rubber, oil, cotton, and everything. He'd first been based in Boston, but later moved his headquarters to New York and had branches in Shanghai, Yokohama, Kobe, Osaka, London, and San Francisco. And then in 1860, with uprisings overspreading China, Uncle William Fogg called me to Shanghai, me, a racial Twombly of Berg Academy. I was now the Shanghai agent for William Fogg's Worldwide China and Japan Trading Company, and I was right in the middle of China's biggest civil war, the Taiping Rebellion. It was terribly exciting for a young man from Maine. I was the only Western lawyer in the city at first, with the Taiping rebels descending upon Shanghai from Nanking. My good friend, Frederick Townsend Ward, was there from Massachusetts, defending us merchants and the Manchu rulers. Near disaster when poor Frederick was wounded, I treated him myself in my house on the bond. What a catastrophe.
Like the Foggs, I was fairly active in civic affairs, too. <clears throat> Did you hear about how I once ran against Boss Tweed's gang for the New York State Assembly and won? Well, that's another story. But when Uncle William Fogg passed away in 1884, I succeeded him as president of his China and Japan Trading Company. And two years later, I did something else. I came back to Berg Academy. Because in all of our journeys, Uncle William Fogg and I remembered Berg Academy and wanted to give something back, just as our ancestors had. Something important for education in our community and something truly excellent. But what could it be? There was something about the coast town of Dunnett which made it seem more attractive than other maritime villages of eastern Maine. Perhaps it was the simple fact of acquaintance with that neighborhood which made it so attaching and gave such interest to the rocky shore and dark woods and the few houses which seemed to be securely wedged and tree nailed in among the ledges by the landing. These houses made the most of their seaward view and there was a gaiety and determined floweriness in their bits of garden ground. The small paned high windows in the peaks of their steep gables were like knowing eyes that watched the harbor and the far sea line be A library is how it began. An excellent one. Hundreds of books. We never had a big library when I went to Berwick Academy, but now our own Sarah Ann Jewett, who graduated in 1865, was a famous author whose books about Maine were read everywhere. When William and Elizabeth Fogg died, their wills called for many gifts, including the William H. Fogg Art Museum at Harvard. At Berwick, Elizabeth's will set aside $50,000 for the erection of a library building and the procurement of books, and it would be called the William H. Fogg Memorial Library, an excellent one. Miss Jewett knew how I felt. We both had traveled into new worlds. We had seen America growing stronger and stronger. We knew a whole new century was about to begin. We wanted to bring some of the best of the world back to Berwick for all the hundreds of Berwick Academy students coming along. And we will do it with this building. As president of the trustees, I had a big job to do, but I wasn't alone. Miss Jewett was on the planning committee. We had another talented and generous cousin in the Fogg family, cousin Hiram Fogg. He was our leader. We hired the best architect in New England, George A. Clough, the city architect of Boston. Sarah Ann Jewett's friend, the artist Sarah Wyman Whitman, designed the interior and 100 colorful stained glass windows. To design the beautiful hilltop grounds, we hired the famous Olmsted landscaping firm, designers of Central Park and Boston's Emerald Necklace. We also had our loyal treasurer, Judge Abner Oaks, whose daughter, Marsha Oaks Woodbury, was now a famous artist. All together, we set about planning our magnificent building to house not only the library, but all of Baroque Academy in a spirit of excellence for the new century. Now at that time, most houses didn't yet have electricity. Well, after seeing the great cities of the world, the one thing for sure I wanted our new building to have was lights.
the building became much more than a library. Fog Memorial was Baruch Academy for generations of students to come. All of us on the Board of Trustees chipped in for a bell, which I had specially cast on one of my business trips to London. We had a big square granite tower, you know, at first. And then in 1910, the big stone tower was replaced by the lovely golden dome you have today. Of course, I never got to see the 20th century in my lifetime, but others continued the tradition of dedication to learning. Teachers devoted their lives to their students. Grateful graduates made donations for at work and building improvements over the years. And there were some difficult times. Yes, Borough graduates were certainly met with all aspects of the 20th century. The Great Depression, two world wars, at the end of World War I, the fog bell pealed and students poured out. They paraded all over South Berwick, joined by citizens and musical instruments as they went. <coughs> but then came World War II, and 276 of our graduates were called to serve in the military, men and women all over the world. From Pearl Harbor to North Africa, from the Normandy beaches to the Battle of the Bulge. Some of them were wounded, some taken prisoner. Ten Baroque Academy men gave their lives, and their names are commemorated on a plaque that hangs in Fog Memorial.
In the 20th century, Baroque Academy had to change to a private school, then a boarding school, and now a country day school to serve the needs of changing times. Up to today, thousands of students and hundreds of teachers have passed through the hallways of Academy buildings from the class of 1791 to the class of 2008. And in the last five years, some of the best things have happened to Baroque Academy ever, thanks to you. Yes, take it from me, old Horatio Twombly, class of 1850. I've seen a lot of people come and go on this hilltop, but nobody more wonderful than you all. Today, I've enjoyed watching Baroque graduates from all through the 20th century, all coming together for a remarkable celebration. We're now on a campus of 55 acres and 10 buildings, the Patricia Baldwin Whipple Art Center. The 1791 house, back on the hilltop. Burley Davidson. The Commons. The Lower School. The Clement Middle School. And soon, the new athletic center. Best of all, just look how beautiful the Fog Memorial Building looks with your new renovations. You certainly deserve a big party tonight. We had a big party too, you know, for the school centennial in 1891. I made a speech and what I told folks that day, 105 years ago, was that their school was among those rare institutions with the power of inspiring and holding the affections of their students throughout their lives. I can see that today it's still true, thanks to the generosity and dedication of today's teachers and students, headmaster and trustees, families and alumni, Baroque Academy in 1996 is the best school that has ever been.